Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another episode of the show. All right, so we're gonna start off with some white wine today. Um, now you may have already looked at the label and noticed that we've probably had this before. Yes, we have. Uh, this <coughs> is the white version. They make three versions, make a red, a white, and a rosé. So this is the uh, M. Chapote uh, Belle Rouge Cote de Rhone. Um, now this is their white wine, so they're Vin Blanc. And it's 2009, I don't know if I said that. Purchased this at World Market for $13.99, almost regularly $13.99. I bought it for $11.99. Now, um, I've already kind of explained that um, the label has Braille on it. And if you want to know more about that, look, look it up on, I think it's episode two, th I'm sorry, 233, I think it is. If I remember correctly, I looked it up earlier. It's not like I can just memorize my episodes uh, that quickly or I know every single episode number everything I did but um, I believe it was come on all right so hold on yeah 233 yeah, hello see I thought I also had another one but I guess it didn't all right so uh, 233 and uh, that'd be the red go through the story of the Braille. All right, so um, what's in this particular uh, blend of grapes? So we got Grenache Blanc, Claret, and Bourbon Blanc. Um, Grenache Blanc is most likely the, the dominant grape in this. Uh, this is from the Southern Rhone. Uh, the other two grapes are lesser known or they're not used as much. Uh, they are used in the Southern Rhone, uh, also in the Languedoc. And uh, they, if you look them up, they're kind of each, each name is a synonym for the other, but they're separate grapes. But they're most likely they're very, very close in type of grape it is. Maybe their DNA is very close. Maybe they, they're related to each other. Maybe the same parentage. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, you know, especially older uh, grapes or when they had a lot of, you know, when they, when they were just naming grapes by region, a lot of times you may have used the same name for two different grapes because they looked close enough the same, you know, close enough the same. But they looked alike. <laughs> they looked alike, so they end up having the same name. Uh, but anyway, so you have three different um, three different varietals. Uh, Claret is make sure. Yes, okay. Claret is one of the grapes uh, that can be used for vermouth. Yeah, did you know vermouth is made out of grapes? Yeah, I did. I knew that, but it's one of those things like. What? All right, so that's one of the that's one of the grapes we'll use to make uh, vermouth. All right, so um, let's see. Let's get right into the wine. Been uh, doing some study group stuff. Really good uh, this past week. I did pretty good. I got in the vicinity. I was a lot a lot closer than I was the last time. I don't really have like you know great whiteness white background to go against but you know color's pretty good um kind of a golden straw well, they should clean these glasses there were, there were like no legs there it was like <laughs> yeah probably should have cleaned this glass better anyway so um note note to self I mean, I'm, I'm, hand, they're, hand, they're being hand washed. It's not like I'm using, I mean, I am using a detergent, but it's not in the, uh, um, whatchamacallit. But if that's any indication, it might be a low viscosity, which should be about right. It's a 13.5% alcohol. All right, so let's just go right into the nose. Mm. 
I get, I wouldn't necessarily say citrusy, maybe more of a stone fruit. More melony, I guess, um, than, uh, than lemon or lime. So, you know, like a cantaloupe type of stuff or not really honeydew. But I would say more of a more of a melon type of aroma to it. Maybe a touch of floral. A slight bit of funk. Not a whole lot, but you know, a little bit of earthiness. Not uh, not the minerality like 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 stone, but more of a slight earthiness, but not a whole lot. Maybe a touch of wood. All right, let's get right into the palette. All right, definitely still more of that. Get that melon it, but but I also get now some of that citrus type of stuff. A little bit of lemon. Um, Really good acid. I mean, I would put this at a medium plus, maybe even high acid. Um, I'll say medium plus acid, definitely for sure. Um, I say off dry. Not bad. Now they talk about getting green apple. I can maybe see that. Um, actually, now that I'm tasting it more, I, really, I probably am getting more of the apple rather than the melon and citrus, but I'm getting I'm really getting a lot of citrus to it. Um, getting some of that apple flavor is starting to come through a little bit more. But um, I don't know what hawthorn and white blossoms are, but I did say floral. And for me, floral is going to be one of those things where it's like, Unless it's a really, really distinct floral that I've smelled, it's just going to be a generic thing. Well, um, I mean, acid's still pretty high. Uh, finish is pretty decent. I'm still tasting it. Um, you know, I'd say it's a pretty decent wine. Chill it a little bit to kind of control the acid, maybe the alcohol a little bit. Um, so it will, it will just kind of tighten it up some more without really affecting the flavors and aromas. And you got yourself, you know, a pretty decent wine for $14 or or uh, twelve dollars, depending on where, where you, you know what you bought it, where you bought it at. But you know, twelve to fourteen dollar bottle of wine, pretty decent. I give it an eighty-eight. I think it's well made. It's pretty well balanced. Um, I, I think, I think uh, room temperature, it's it's a little bit uh, hot. You know, the the acids really kind of coming through a lot. But you chill you chill it a little bit, and it'll be really good. Um, would definitely uh, look at, you know, look at seeking out this wine. Um, like I said, uh, check out episode 233. Go to, stop by the website, hit uh, find uh, episode 233, and I've got a little bit of the story uh, about it. Or you can just click the link. I'll have the link below uh, for this, and you can go to the website, ch check out the uh, the reason behind the Braille. Um, so we got that. Um, I got about a minute and a half before I have to go to the next wine here. So, you know, doing the sommelier study group stuff, uh, uh, it's been really helpful so far. I've only, only done a couple of them, but it's really getting me to that critical thinking of wine where I don't know the answer. Uh, so like this this past one, I, I, I got down that it was Old World Chardonnay in France, uh, which actually is all I have to do for the level that I'm at. I don't have to go any farther than that. Um, but I went to Chablis, and it was actually um, it was actually Burgundy. But um, you know, I felt pretty good that I at least got Old World Chardonnay and France out of it. I would have liked to have been able to say that it was Burgundy rather than Chablis. But the problem with me is that when I think white, when I think Chardonnay and French Chardonnay, I think Chablis. So I know that my 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 mental process was like, boom, go to Chablis. That's the only only Chardonnay in the world, which it, it, it's not as far as French Chardonnay, but um, just, just kind of advice if you're trying to do a blind tasting,
just don't automatically think Chardonnay or don't automatically think white burgundy. Uh, it could be one or the other. And look for the, look for the indicators of that. Um, you know, with, with Chablis, it's going to have a lot more uh, that, that stone type of stuff with the minerality, whereas with Burgundy, it'll have less of that and more of the oak characteristics because they do use some oak. Uh, they do use oak for the Chardonnay, whereas in Chablis, they don't, hence the, quote, naked or un -oak Chardonnay or Chablis-style Chardonnay because they use stainless steel rather than oak. All right, so um, we're going to move on to the next wine. Uh, we're going to do the... Uh, premium wine and I'm really excited about doing this one because um, a friend of mine I saw on Facebook get it for the Pinot Noir version. All right, so on to the next one. All right, now we're back with the next wine here. Now, funny thing about this wine, I was, I, a friend of mine on Facebook uh, posted a picture of the Pinot Noir of this. And of course, being the geek that I am, I see the label, well, I mean, you're all you can tell. You know, that it's got all this geeky type of stuff on there. So I had to get it. All right. So I went ahead and bought it. And uh, I went over to um, Saglin Benny's here in San Antonio. And I went to the person and I said, look, I'm looking for a wine for my study group. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. And this was not the wine. Uh, we ended up getting a different wine. It was a California cab. But... Uh, uh, I saw this and I was like, oh, I want this label at least. It was not the Pinot Noir, but at least it was a cab. So uh, let's get right into this. So this is the Educated Guess 2009 uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Napa Valley. Uh, bought it, like I said, at Saglin Benny's for $23.99. So we're going to make this our premium selection. And um, oh, poured a little too much for just for a rinse. But um, all right, so these guys are, like I said, are out of Napa Valley. Um, and, uh, it's one of those things where they, uh, they were like, well, you know, we were sitting around one day trying to figure out a name for a wine and, and, and educated guests came up. All right. Which, you know, like they, they talk about on their website, when you buy a wine, you're kind of making an educated guess. If you, if you're buying wine, you've never had before, you're looking at the label, you're looking at the back label, you're looking at where it's from, the vintage, you're making all these looking at all these things on there and you're kind of doing something in your head like your own, your own little formula try to figure out what you're gonna get and uh, so that's what they came up with the whole educated guest thing so um, let's kind of go through uh, them a little bit uh, they're the roots run deep winery so that's the main winery and this is one of their labels that they have uh, they've been around for a while uh, the gentleman that started it has been in all aspects of the wine business. He's been in restaurants, he's been in retail, he's been in distribution. So he, he, kind of, he knows the consumer end of things and the distribution end of things, and now he knows the winemaking side of things. Um, and they have you know quite a few different wines, uh, but let's get right into the, um, uh, this particular wine. Well, actually, first let's go into the, into the, uh, the formulae on the label. All right, so these are actually five different formulae Formulae, formulae, formulae. Anyway, the Latin version of formulas. But anyway, so there's five formulae on here, and uh, they actually are real. Actually, they're real. All right. So we're gonna go from here, and we're gonna go kind of what counter counterclockwise in the description. So the uh, this one is the sulfur dioxide and enology. A sulfur. It's a formula that describes sulfur dioxide and analogy. It's the formation of uh, acet oh, sorry, acetylhyde um, in response to SO2, so uh, sulfuric, uh, sulfuric, not acid, but uh, di di sulfur dioxide. That's it, sulfur dioxide. I had to get, remember my chemistry for a second. Uh, in the fermentation part, and they took that from Cornell University. Um, most of these you got from Cornell. Uh, the next one down is sulfur dioxide and wine quality, the, a reductive process graph showing how SO2 kills bacteria and uh, SO2 inhibits oxidation and bottle fermentation and SO2 blocks polymerization. So this is uh, significant because SO2 or sulfur is one of the things that kills not only bacteria, but um, it also hurts with the fermentation. So the, uh, we get too much CO2, the yeasts stop converting the sugars into alcohol, okay? 
Um, and don't ask me what polymerization is. I've heard of it, but I can't explain it. All right. Um, all right. The next one down: bleaching of red wine with excess with excess sulfur dioxide and uh, flav, flavillium flavillium cation and anthocyanins. All right. So the main word there to remember is anthocyanins, and those are the basically the pigments. Uh, it's, pig, it's pigment in flowers and grapes, so it's uh, the pigment of the wine or the pigment of the grapes. Sulfide production, that's the middle one, during fermentation, they got that from Virginia Tech. And then general chemistry, that's sucrose conversion to glucose and fructose with structures. So I guess the structures are the, you know, the little diagrams. All right, so that was your, that was your geeky part of, of, the, uh, of the thing. All right, so now let's go through what these are. Now they, they source their grapes from all over Napa Valley. They don't necessarily have their own vineyards. They, they source their grapes from other wine growers or grape growers. Um, and I'll go through um, uh, the numbers, okay? 100% Napa Valley. Now out of that, 89% is from Rutherford and St. Helena. 11% is from Yonteville or Yonteville, Oak Knoll and Calistoga. All right, the breakdown of the varietals, um, which we pay attention, it's gonna be kind of the subject of Wine 101 today. Uh, 89% 89 Merlot, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. I hope so, because it's a cab. 6% uh, Merlot, 4% Cabernet Franc, 1% 1 Petit Verdot, um, aged for 12 months in French and American oak. Now, they don't tell me how much of each, but that's okay. And they say $20 suggested price. So, Sacramento sells for $23.99. So, you might find it for $20, you might find it for less, but we call it a premium because it's 20 bucks and over. Okay? All right, so let's check it out. Now they spent six minutes describing the wine. All right, it's got a really deep color. I really can't see your hand through it. Um, like I said, I don't really have any white to, to go against since this is my timer, so it's a black background, and that's silver. But, um, you know, the rim variation is not a whole lot. Stains the glass a little bit. Now that I've had some wine in there, let's see if, uh, let's see if I can see any legs. Hey, I got some legs now. Really low viscosity, very low viscosity. All right, let's check it out. Get really the dark cherries, or not dark cherries, but dark dark fruit. And maybe it is cherry. Maybe some strawberry to it. I don't get much floral. I do get a bit of earthiness. Um, bit of woodiness to it, woods type of stuff. Maybe a hint of chocolate to it. I know there's Cabernet Franc in there, but I'm not really getting any pepper yet. It's not green pepper. But spice-wise, spice-wise I would say I'm getting some spices to it. Um, Kind of peppery, like pep, like white, white, white and black pepper type of stuff, but just in general spices. I wouldn't necessarily say cinnamon or nutmeg, but I get that kind of baking spices. Okay, which that is from the oak. That's part of one of the oak characteristics. All right, let's check it out. First of all, I like this wine a whole heck of a lot. All right, so we'll just get that out of the way. Um, so I got a lot, get a lot of stuff going on here. I get the the fruit pie aspect, and that is actually kind of a after a lot of stuff, but that's what's lingering right now. So kind of on the the back end, uh, tannins, uh, really good tannins. They really they really coat the mouth pretty well. I've got a good body. Good mouthfeel to it. Uh, I'd say medium plus on the tannins. Um, acidity medium to medium high, or medium plus, I'm sorry. Not a sweet wine. Okay. 
feel a bit of wood aspect to it, but not overpowering. So it's not like it really, I don't necessarily feel like I'm biting into a tree trunk, but you've got elements of cedar box type of stuff. Um, so like, you know, wooden box type of thing. Um, really, like I said, really good fruit pie aspect. I'm not getting any of the peppery stuff that I would, I would typically expect from Cab Franc. I know it's only 4%, but it doesn't take much Cab Franc to really get a green pepper or, or not jalapeno, but that, that green pepper um, aspect to it. I'm probably fishing for it, but I'm starting to get it. I think if I let this wine open for a little bit longer, it would open up a little more. I might get that. Finish is long. It's a long finish. Um, I mean, I would, I would consider us a, a very good, high quality wine. Uh, it's a $20 plus wine that drinks as well as wines that are more expensive. And that was, um, that was one of the goals of the gentleman that started this, which I really should tell you his name because it'd probably be a good idea. And, oh, that's because it's under vineyards. All right, so the gentleman who started this uh, is Mark Albrecht. And his, jo his, his philosophy is to have wines that drink like $50 and up wines. I say you did a good job for, not him specifically, his wine, the, his team, the winemakers. But, I, you know, Mark, your, your wine, ta you know, I think it'd stand up to anything out there. So, um, uh, which that means I'm going to be giving it a pretty good score. So let's score it up because I'm already at 11 minutes in this segment and I need to get started on the next one. Um, I'm going to give it a 92. Um, I think it's an excellent wine. I think it's well made. The balance is there. Um, I'm still tasting it. So the long finish and that, you know, long finishes have, have a tendency to give you an idea of a quality of a wine. So, or, or helps, you know, adds to the quality of the wine. It's not necessarily the, the only indicator. A lot of things are. But absolutely, you want, you've got 20 bucks, 20, 20 to $25 to spend on this. I say get it, and you want the geekiness, and you want to talk about the formula and tell people all about it. Pick it up. All right, so uh, that's going to do it for this wine. We're going to move on to the next segment. It's all going to be about labels. Stay tuned. All right, so now let's get into a little bit of Wine 101 today. Um, so here comes the question. All right, so why don't European wines have the grape variety on them or on the label? Well, it's kind of a generalization, but it, it holds true for the most part. If you notice wines from the old world, European wines, and new world, American, and other, uh, other new world wines like Australia, South America, South Africa, okay? You'll notice that uh, they don't have, they tend to not have the varietals on the old world wines where the new world does. All right, so why is that? Well, let's go through some European history first. Um, Europe has had a lot of, Europe's, each country's wine regions tend to grow specific grapes, okay? Um, and this has a lot to do with um, uh, climate and weather, but trial and error, really, you know, over time, they kind of figured out what grows really well in certain parts of each country, you know? They know that Cabernet Sauvignon does not grow well in the Mosul in Germany. Uh, they know that Riesling doesn't grow really well in Rioja. I'm not saying that they planted Riesling over there, but they know based upon the characteristics of these grapes over time, over the hundreds of years, if not thousand years or so, they've grown some of these grapes in some of these uh, European areas, uh, and actually uh, Western, uh, quote Western Asia, or you know, Middle East, uh, actually still kind of part of Europe, I guess, but uh, they figured out what grows well in certain areas. So they tend to just grow those grapes. And because of that, um, people just kind of know, all right? So it's, a, you know, those grapes are associated with those areas. Like I said, Riesling is associated with Germany. Uh, the, the grape varietals in Champagne are, are well known uh, as far as Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier, and Pinot Noir. Um, Alsace is known for, for uh, uh, Pinot Gris, or Pinot Grigio, if you're talking about the Italian version of it, or Italian name of it. Uh, and they also make uh, Riesling, they make, they make other varietals there, but they're known really for their white wines rather than their red wines. 
Uh, Burgundy is known for Pinot Noir and also Chardonnay on the white side. So you've got uh, grape varietals associated with specific areas. All right, American history. So really this whole labeling stuff with American history kind of started post-prohibition. Um, and it was really about the, the wine interest really growing in, in America. Up until prohibition, uh, you had some really good wine being made. Matter of fact, a lot of California wines were you know, winning gold medals and winning international wine competitions. And then prohibition happened and major winemaking had to stop. So World War, II, World War II saw a lot of soldiers that went to Europe, uh, tasted some pretty darn good wine, and came back. It was like, man, I really would like to get Chablis and Burgundy wine, okay? So um, that's where you got this generic labeling from. So you get these you know, jug wines that were red, and they called it Burgundy. And you get these jug wines that were white, and they called it Chablis. Um, and whether they actually had Chardonnay or Pinot Noir in them was, was another matter, but that's what people started associating. They're, oh, Chablis and Burgundy, they're French wines, and, you got, and they're really good. You know, those are good wines, right? Because people didn't know what was in them. Then you had a gentleman by the name of Frank uh, Schoonmaker uh, who uh, was hired by the Almaden Winery, and uh, he was a big proponent on, on marketing wine differently and, and putting what was in what was you know in the wine what grape was in the wine um, and that's where you kind of got this wine boom in the 70s and in the 80s and the marketing along with that where you know you said Chardonnay it said Cabernet Sauvignon it said Pinot Grigio or it said whatever Merlot okay and that type of success the rest of the new world kind of notice that hey they really are marketing it this way in the United States, so let's kind of pick up on that. All right, let's go through some uh, European laws here, okay? Um, most appellations in Europe have very strict uh, varietal requirements. This is because over time, like I said, they figured out what works well, so they decided to kind of keep that sense of place is that you can only grow to, to, to put yourself in that appellation, so if you wanted to uh, have champagne as your you know on, stamped on your la label you could only use three one of the three grapes or two of the three grapes all three of the grapes and then after, after that there was Blanc de Blanc and Blanc de Noir and all that kind of stuff but um, if you wanted to have uh, use the app use the Burgundy the Burgundian Appalachians the AOC's or the Villages uh, or the Cruz you have to use Pinot Noir or you have to use Chardonnay um, Bordeaux, you can only use the five approved, uh, five approved varietals to use those type, you know, to use Plaillac on your on your label, that kind of stuff. In Italy, the same thing. You can't you can't you know use Cabernet Sauvignon and call yourself Chianti. You have to use Sangiovese, okay? And you can use a few other grapes. So they would do is they would say, well, maybe it's only one grape, or maybe it's this main grape and a few others. Um, so they would determine based upon the very specific AOCs or appellations. Um, you also have aging, the yield, the alcohol, sugar level. So they really um, put into law what you can use, uh, not just the grapes, but how you age it, what type of oak you can use, how long you age it, um, how long you have to store it in some cases, uh, whether it's stored in barrel, sto sto stored in bottle. Um, they, that's kind of how the whole Appalachian system in Europe uh, evolved and formed. Uh, with the success of the New World way of doing things, they started having more generalized Appalachians, so you could have more flexibility in what you used and how you did it. And that's where you th had things like Super Tuscan come along. Okay, uh, American laws. Prior to 1973, you had to, as far as putting uh, Chardonnay on the label, it only needed to be at least 51% Chardonnay. After 1973, um, it had to be 75% of that wine had to be Chardonnay to put the word Chardonnay on it. Um, in Oregon, they changed that to 90% for Pinot Noir. Now, if you make a Pinot Grigio or Pinot Gris, is it, usually they use Pinot Gris in Oregon, um, it still has to be 75%. Um, it didn't have to be 90%. 
All right. To come from a specific AVA, and that's what they're called, you call the American Viticultural Area. So an AVA in the United States. So if you want to call yourself Napa Valley or Russian River Valley or Texas Hill Country, oh, we'll, we'll kind of skip a few things here. Um, but let's say you want to call yourself Will, Willamette Valley, or Columbia Valley, okay? 85% of the grapes have to come from that AVA. Now, it doesn't mean you can't get, say, grapes from another part of the state, okay, uh, you can use 15%, up to 15% of the grapes from another state, from, from with another area in the state, um, and still do that. Uh, state and county AVA, so if you want to put California, or Texas, or Oregon, or you want to say it's Sonoma County, or you want to say it's Comal County, uh, it only has to be 75% of the grapes came from that county, all right, to use that AVA. Again, it can be a blend. It doesn't have to be Chardonnay. It could be, you know, my Mark's Red Wine from Sonoma County, and only 75% of the grapes have to come from Sonoma County. I can get the other 25% from Alameda or something like that, okay? For California and Texas, uh, to use those state um, AVAs, uh, you have to use 100% have to come from California and, eight, and only 85% from Texas. Now, let's kind of backtrack. I want to use California as my AVA, all right? 100% have to come from California. But say I want to use Oregon as my AVA. Only 75% have to come from Oregon. I can take 25% from Washington. Especially like we were talking Columbia Valley. Maybe my winery's in Columbia Valley, but across the border, there's 25% of the grapes um, are pretty good, and I want to use those. I can still call myself an Oregon wine, all right? Uh, Texas has to be 85%. So again, 15% of those grapes can come from California, which is not uncommon with Texas wineries. Um, for vintage, it has to be 95% has to come from that vintage. Okay, so that means 5% of my wine can come from last year, the year before, the year before that, whatever. All right, so why? Now I went through all kind of the, the rules and all that. So what's going on here? Well, Europeans, they kind of already know. I mean, they've grown up as part of their tradition. Um, they know that Pinot Noir comes from Burgundy. Okay, they know that the five varietals are are in of, of some. The can, five varietals can be in Bordeaux wine, and not necessarily in what order, but a lot of chateau. They kind of go well. We're mostly Cabernet Sauvignon. We're mostly Merlot, um, and you, they just kind of know that. Um, in Champagne, you, there, there's a little that a little bit of labeling Blanc de Noir. Blanc de Blanc, okay, Blanc de Blanc tells it right there, it's Chardonnay, all right, but they don't put Chardonnay on there because they just know it's Chardonnay. In Germany, they pretty much grow Riesling. They grow other grapes. They have Pinot Noir there. Um, they have uh, Muller Turgal, and they do Gewürz Demeanor, and uh, what was the other one I wanted? Um, oh, dang it, it's an Austrian grape mostly, but um, they grow that stuff. You know, in Italy, same thing, Spain, Portugal, they all kind of know it's already grown there, so they don't really need to put the la they don't need to put it on there. Um, they've had, like I said, hundreds of years, not thousands of years to figure out where, what works best. Uh, American laws don't have those restrictions, so I can grow whatever I want in the hill country of Texas. I can grow whatever I want in Anderson Valley. If I want to grow Riesling there, cool. Maybe I found a small spot in Anderson Valley that grows Riesling really well. Um, Maybe I know that Tempranillo is going to grow really well, or maybe Tanat is going to grow really well, or I don't really care. I just want to grow Tanat because I like it. I'm just going to make a wine out of it. Um, we don't, and we also don't have that hundreds of years of tradition because Americans are still tinkering around what, what works best in what area. It's, it's kind of an open market, whatever they want to do. So American lawmakers haven't decided, you know what, we have this sense of place. You know, my winemakers are all gravitating towards Tempranillo in this part of Texas. So to make this AVA, we're going to say you have to grow Tempranillo or a certain percentage of it has to be Tempranillo. All right. And then the second part, marketing, marketing, marketing. It's kind of like location, location, location. Um, really, like I said, location really has no meaning in the United States. Um, but especially in the big four, California, Oregon, Washington State, and New, New York, um, the AVAs are starting to get these identities, these smaller, you know, the, the more specific AVAs. 
are kind of being known for that they grow Riesling really well or they grow Cabernet Sauvignon really well or maybe they grow kind of like the, the Bordeaux varieties really well so they make Meritages, okay, that type of stuff. So that's, that's really what's going on with the labeling is that it, it's not that Europeans are trying to be all stuck up, but it's just how they are. It's their culture. It's not part of the culture to slap Pinot Noir on the label. That doesn't mean you won't find that, especially with some of the more branded uh, labels out there because Europeans are looking at what Americans do and go, hmm, maybe for my brand wines, because, you know, Joe's, uh, Joe's French Red, well, now where's Joe's French Red from? What's in it? So people kind of want to know what's in it instead of like Chateau Fusco. Oh, well, Chateau Fusco always uses Pinot Noir, okay, or Domaine or whatever. Um, so that's really what's going on is that it's not that they're being snobby. It's just that's their culture and that's how they did it. Um, whereas Americans and the New World, it's they're still figuring it out. And honestly, I really hope that the New World doesn't really ever get to that it has to be these these grapes because having IGTs uh, in Italy, having you know the Super Tuscans in general, uh, having the generic um, uh, appellations in Europe allow them to experiment and try new things because sometimes you have to break tradition to, to move forward. All right, so that's going to do it for uh, this version of Wine 101. Hope you found it informative. Hope it kind of demystified the reasoning behind the labeling. Um, not how to read a label, but uh, demystify the labeling a little bit. And uh, as always, thank you for stopping by. Hit the links above to friend me up. Hit the links below for the, uh, for the wineries. Hit the donate button, send a few ducats, and we'll see everyone again next time.